Thank you for joining this session. Um, as uh, Clotilde explained in the introduction, the idea of this, uh, of this uh, separate session is to go a little bit deeper into each of the pillar and explore a specific question with a panel that I will uh, soon introduce. So uh, this session is about uh, the second pillar, so deployment incentives. Uh, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, they are uh, a key element of uh, the scale-up of, ca of carbon removal for different reasons, and they can also achieve different outcomes. We, we will explore that during the, the conversation. Um, uh, yeah, Historically, deployment incentives such as uh, subsidy schemes have been instrumental in scaling uh, other climate technologies such as wind and solar. And uh, if we want to durably uh, remove carbon from the atmosphere, uh, at the scale of million tons per year by 2050. Uh, such incentives are needed, uh, again, as I said, to support the lab exits uh, and exploratory scale-up in which we take the CDR methods into the real world, uh, test them and uh, gather data that will then uh, increase certainty about the, the scale at which we can de uh, deploy them. Um, so the panel consists of four speakers. Uh, they will each get a chance to have their say on how we can deploy and scale up CDR, uh, zooming on deployment incentives. Um, then uh, I will open the discussion among the panelists. And finally, we will have around 10 to 15 minutes for a question and answer to the audience. So please prepare your questions as we go. Um, and then a, a colleague of mine will come to you with a microphone to take the questions. Um, so we also have uh, a rapporteur for this session, uh, so he, Chris Sherwood uh, will uh, take good notes and, and uh, follow the conversation and he will be in charge of um, uh, sharing the content of the session later when we gather again for the plenary. So thank you Chris for accepting this role. Um, and yeah, with that, uh, we're good to go. Uh, so I'd like to kick off the discussions uh, to turning to the European Commission with Alexandre Paco that we already introduced. Uh, so director for the DG Clima Unit on innovation for a low carbon resilient economy. Um, so the European Commission, as you said in your introduction, has recently put out a communication setting out its thinking on the contribution of carbon removals for the 2040 climate targets and the role to be played by industrial carbon removal. So uh, I'd like to ask you to start with, uh, what specific policies will be needed to deploy different carbon removal in Europe at the pace and scale needed? The floor is yours. And yeah. Thank you very much. I, I will be short because I, you know, I've already said quite a lot in my introduction. So, um, uh, and I would like to listen to the other panelists uh, and you. Uh, but I can say that, of course, in, in terms of incentive, uh, we have to look in terms of regulatory incentive and financial incentive. So, the regulatory incentive for us uh, means that we will be looking in the next couple of years, so until 2026 into policy options, such as integration of carbon removals or certain carbon removals into, into DTS, uh, setting specific targets, uh, I think as you have also listed in your, in your recommendations. Um, and in terms of the funding uh, incentives here, clearly uh, continuing the support in terms of research and innovation, as, it's, as I said as well. So the next uh, Horizon Europe uh, program, uh, we really hope, will also play a key role in this. Um, and in terms of how to scale up uh, this type of, of technologies, there also you have a, a number of ideas in your in your report, uh, be in terms of uh, procurement, uh, be in terms of uh, voluntary carbon markets, uh, be in terms of uh, auction. That could be also uh, you know an, an option. So things are, are still pretty open. Uh, what one will have to keep in mind is, of course, we are coming into um, a situation where the constraints of the EU budget is going to increase. So um, with Ukraine, uh, with the defense uh, being top priorities, of course, for, 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 for Europe, uh, it means that there will be another look at, at the budget. Uh, so here we will also need to look at not only EU solutions, but also national solutions. Mm -hmm. And here the EU ETS revenues uh, are also very important 
a stream of revenues that can be used also to support uh, CDM deployment. So still many open questions, I would say. So I'm, I'm here more to, to listen to, to you and, and the others. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe just a, a follow up before we move to the next panelist, uh, because of course some member states have already taken uh, some initiatives and are working or proposing specific uh, schemes to support uh, actually specific CR methods. So I'm wondering how you look at it. Uh, can, do you see that this can be um, complementary and work together with potentially new deployment incentive the EU would uh, create? Uh, is it an inspire, uh, do, you, do you find it inspiring for, to design like a, or replicate a similar model at the EU level? Yeah, how do you use these experiences? Oh, sure, we, we are very keen to learn from these uh, national experiences because uh, as we said since this morning, this is a very nascent market, so we need to look into how to stimulate it as, as best as possible in the most cost-effective way. So yes, at this stage, we are really very much into, into uh, looking at what is happening in Europe, but also elsewhere. Great, thank you very much uh, for this introductory remarks. Uh, I'll go next to Sven Clément. Uh, so we have the pleasure to have Sven Clément from uh, Luxembourg. Uh, he's um, <laughs> MP from the Pirate Party in the Luxembourg Parliament. Um, so in your role as an MP, you have proposed a bill uh, to foster the development of novel CDR methods through a negative emission tariff uh, in Luxembourg. If adopted, it would create uh, direct subsidies for mid-sized projects for CO2 air capture and CO2 sequestration. So my question is, uh, what role can national initiatives like this uh, play in developing CDR? Uh, and maybe you can start with an update on, on this uh, specific uh, proposal that is very interesting. And thank you, Sylvain. Thank you for having me. Actually, um, I'm probably the least qualified person to be here because I'm a policymaker and we need to hear from the sector what we should be doing or not be doing. But if I'm looking at the numbers and also at the introduction this morning, I see that the main problem is not demand. We have oversold the capacity to sequester uh, CO2 by m huge margins, to be honest. So the question is not how can we stimulate demand, the question is more how can we stimulate the offer. And there we need to create whatever markets we can create. And one of the solutions I came up with together with a huge team of uh, participative uh, dialogue was to look at what worked in the past. And what worked in the past was for solar installations to really um, get a rocket start when they introduced the first um, negative tariffs. So if the injection tariffs that we created on solar were like the inspiration on how can we boost the offer of uh, CDR. And part of that solution is then the negative emissions tariff, which we called then the ALNET proposal for Luxembourg negative emissions tariff uh, proposal, which essentially says we start with very high price and then based on the market conditions we reduce the negative emissions uh, tariff um, as soon as certain thresholds of uh, offer are being met. That should guarantee that nobody gets too rich, but at the same time we create the right incentives to use taxpayer money where it's really needed. That bill has been proposed um, about a year ago. Um, Luxembourg has a very strange system. We are unicameral, so we have only one parliament. But we have a so-called Council of State which is a almost second chamber, which advises every bill that uh, gets introduced. And they, uh, last week, uh, um, published their opinion on our bill, which essentially said, well, we don't see the opportunity why we should do that nationally. We should wait for the EU to do something, which is a very strange thing to say as a legislator to like, hmm, I don't want to work. I just want to wait for somebody else to do my work. So uh, we are now using all the arguments we have and we will reply to that opinion um, in committee so that we can move the bill forward and hopefully um, really have that debate in plenary on what and how, uh, we can, how we can create that offer. Because demand side, if we are looking at the big commitments by the big uh, spenders in the CDR space, we, we see that they are willing to buy at quite reasonably reasonable prices. The problem is that 
not enough offer is on the market to actually sequester uh, that CO2. So uh, my bill is more oriented to boost the offer than uh, the demand side. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's very interesting because that's a, a very concrete example of uh, one country taking an initiative and then potentially waiting for the EU, we'll see. But uh, that's very interesting. Uh, also, the, how the, 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 the project was conceived uh, was very uh, inspiring. Um, in creating this bill, uh, Sven, uh, what other mechanism have you reviewed and uh, you know, how did you land it on this particular uh, approach? If you want to boost anything, you can have direct funding, you can simply spend money or do call for uh, tenders and, and then just look at whoever wants your free money, essentially. That works not that well, to be honest. We, we do that mostly in defense spending, and well, we see how well our armies have been equipped over the last years, so that we are already scrambling after two years of war. Um, so. I came from that perspective of how can we create a durable, a sustainable solution to really jumpstart um, the market. And so we looked at what worked in the past. Um, direct spending, direct funding works at the prototype phase. It's nice to have Horizon 2020. It's very important to, to boost academia, to boost the initial tech transfer. But the moment you try to commercialize something, you need to have a market, but you also need to be able to scale up and you have to have access to private uh, capital. Private capital normally wants at least certain guarantees when they enter a new market that they have no clue about. And the main issue when it comes to CDR is that it's a market that nobody really knows what guarantees they have that one side, the technology works, and second, that the market actually exists. You can have letter of intents, those are worth exactly nil if in the end your tech doesn't work or doesn't work as promised. So the goal was really to provide incentives also for the private sector to invest into CDR projects, and so we also introduced that question of what are we aiming for? So at the one hand you have carbon capture and usage, CCU, that will play a role to um, transition shipping, transition the airline industry. A, a ship that we buy today will not be decarbonized before 2050. Simply impossible. So the question is how can we transition those ships? So we need to have something for the usage, a lower tariff, and a higher tariff if you want to store it durably. Because also, who will pay for cleaning up the mess somebody else made in the past. Well, traditionally, it's to a certain extent the taxpayer, so that's also the reason why we opted for a negative emissions tariff, which can play a role in ETS, because that will actually be a second pillar of financing. You can have financing through ETS, and then you can get the negative emissions tariff on top, so that it's financially viable to actually sequester durably the CO2 that you capture. So that's a bit the analysis with it. Thank you very much. Um, you touched on a question that I think is a little bit of a sticky problem. It's always, are we demand or supply constrained, right? And you have all kind of uh, approaches to that. So I think it's a good segue to go to our next panelist, uh, Paolo Pifaretti, who's a CEO and co-founder of Carbonix. So Carbonix is a private initiative that acts as a procurement and management partner for high dura durability um, and quality uh, carbon dioxide removals, securing off-tax agreements uh, for CDR suppliers. Um, so, uh, yeah, Paolo, maybe you can say a word of uh, your vision from where you stand in the ecosystem, and then potentially touch on this question of, you know, supply demand and what's your perception on that. So it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And it's a bit of a surprise to hear that um, there, is a, there is more demand than actual supply since uh, supply is very much conditional of the demand. And right now what we're seeing is very much a trickle of large volume demand, I would say, a serious bankable demand. Um, and so, and I think there's many reasons for, for why that is the case, but you touched upon it and I think we're lacking certainty. Uh, today, there is uh, no clear guidance as to how uh, these carbon removal credits will be applied, how can they be implemented, 
And I think the third, the, the private sector is very much waiting for such a confirmation, an indication as to how these will be used. And from the moment we, moment we get that, uh, we will start seeing much bigger commitments coming from the private sector. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe you could share a little bit more uh, on uh, precisely these actors, what, are, uh, what is holding them back from, you know, purchasing, um, and how deployment incentives that we've discussed in the Pillar 2 could change a little bit the game on that. I think um, what we need to understand is the CDR industry is very much an infrastructure industry, and so for it to scale to climate relevance, what we need is... Uh, Project financing. Project financing is done only on the back of bankable offtakes. And again, for bankable offtakes to take place, you need certainty, uh, you need visibility. Um, where I think the European Commission or Europe could st stand up also and provide maybe additional support is in, for instance, facilitating funds that guarantee that bankability of, of the offtakes, of these purchases. For, uh, for then infrastructure funds to feel comfortable uh, providing this project financing. When, uh, when CarbonX talks about what the biggest risks are for the industry, we always talk about project financing. There is only so much that can be done, uh, done with venture funds, um, and we already are, I believe, hitting so, some of a mark. And so it's, it's really now time that we, we get to this phase of the market where we see larger volume offtakes take place and, and, uh, and project financing step up. Okay, and then maybe one last question for you, Paolo, is uh, also about this momentum we've described in the introduction uh, that the sector is experiencing. Mm -hmm. But there are some also say that there are some concerns that maybe the VCM is also stalling a little bit, or I, I don't know, do you have a view on that uh, from where you stand? No, so, so where I do agree, however, is that given that there is a sort of a growing clarity as to the fact that permanent carbon removals will be eventually enforced. Uh, we're seeing indeed a growing number of buyers uh, coming into the market, and we're seeing you know, very substantial RFPs taking place. Uh, now in the growing hundreds of thousands of tons, which initially was uh, almost unheard of. You know, I mean, for us, the market really exists uh, since two years, I would say. Um, you know, last year we saw only a couple of, uh, of uh, purchases, maybe, uh, maybe just uh, you know, five or less than five, you know, before beyond the hundreds of thousands of tons. Now in, um, in, at the very beginning of this year, we already are aware of like multiple of these RFPs taking place. So I think there is a, a growing momentum on the demand side. I think this can be very much a, a market-driven industry. What it needs is certainty. What it needs is visibility to then, uh, you know, f fully uh, uh, take place. Okay, thank you very much, Paolo. Um, I'll, I'll now go to Sabine Frank from Carbon Market Watch. Uh, welcome, and thank you for being with us. Uh, so, uh, Carbon Market Watch is an environmental NGO focused on uh, emission reductions and acting as a watchdog for carbon markets. Um, you also have a very interesting initiative right now. I don't know if you still hear me. Yeah. Uh, which is the Cool Down Project. Maybe you will say a word about this, where you are also looking uh, quite in depth on what could a CDR strategy look like. So, yeah, I guess uh, if you can say a word on that, and um, then also my question to you would be, what would be for you the best case scenario for uh, the, the deployment of carbon removal in Europe? Um, and with, again, uh, a little bit of a focus on deployment incentive and how we can use it. Thank you, Silva, and uh, good morning. Yes, you said Carbon Market Watch focuses on emissions. That's uh, right. We also work on removals. We have a much smaller team than Carbon Gap, but we try and keep up with Carbon Gap um, in that field. But um, the introduction is right in that, yes, we're still very much concerned with the emission reductions, yeah. well knowing what roles uh, removals have to um, play and that's why maybe you will find me you'll think that I'm on the wrong, wrong panel with the remarks that I'm going to make but I hope that overall they will still go in, in the right direction 
Uh, when you ask about the best case scenario for carbon uh, deployment, I, I want to say, first of all, the best case scenario is already gone, where we can't have that anymore, because that would have been one where we practically need no carbon removals. And so we are left with the second best uh, scenario, which is to need minimal amounts of carbon removals to compensate for residual emissions, and then eventually to go into um, net negative uh, territory, which is where CDR will really come into its own. So that to say, prioritizing emission reductions, especially in terms of how we spend our resources, and we've already had references on competing demands on budgets, not just from the climate field, but also from completely other fields. Um, so that must be our focus. But that said, Carbon Gap is right in pointing out to begin with in the paper, that there are CDR governance gaps. That is, that EU policy is not yet geared to ensure that carbon removals will play the role that they will need to play in reaching climate neutrality. And we can observe that in, in all relevant policy files so far, uh, the focus is on CCS, CCU, and CDR for offsetting. So. <laughs> All the talk about carbon removal so far is very much focused on still on dealing with emissions and not CDR for CDR's sake. There's a lot of education still to be done about the essential role of carbon removals. So we need, therefore, we need clarity on the use case of CDR units. And I think that's where there is also still maybe a bit of unclarity in the carbon uh, gap paper. To have clarity on the use case of CDR unit, units means to, be, means to be clear who pays, who benefits, and why are we doing them, why are we creating them in the first place. And as long as we do not have clarity on this use case, then we are in troubled waters when discussing specific policies for deploying carbon removals in the EU at the pace and the scale needed. To emphasize this even more, we cannot get any dedicated CDR policy instrument right until removals and emission reductions are clearly separated with three pillars of EU climate action. And I take great courage from uh, Monsieur Paco, Paco saying, we will set separate targets. I hope you haven't misspoken. Um, if that is really coming, then that is a great development. And Carbon Gap is also very clear here. It calls in its paper for a union-wide binding target for carbon removal with nested targets for land-based and higher durability removals as an enabling condition for a CDR strategy. So kudos for being so absolutely clear about that. However, it would also be helpful if carbon gaps, uh, comprehensive carbon removal strategy would be clearer about the use case for carbon removals, as I have said, so as to translate the principle that CDR must complement but not substitute emission reductions well. This translation has to happen well. Otherwise, this carbon, what we call, call the carbon confusion, the confusion about what carbon removals are uh, for, will continue to exist. It will continue to dominate um, the policy making space and it will continue to stand in the way of the scale up of CDR. In particular, you will allow me a little bit of criticism of, of the strategy. What, what I felt throughout as I read the paper is that the demarcation of carbon removals from the offsetting of emissions that need to be reduced is not entirely clear. Uh, rather, here and there, it seems that support for the use of carbon removals for offsetting purposes of non-residual emissions uh, shines through. It seems to be a sort of compromise area of <laughs> getting removals going for them eventually to fulfill their, fulfill their proper purpose. And that lack of demarcation then also leads to erroneous proposals such as the CDR integration in the ETS. We could say more about how you describe, how you go about this in, in the paper probably will uh, will come to that. I would say it's much better that Carbon Gap has taken up the proposal for the creation of a separate EU-wide removals trading system because this is where the purchase of CDR units is an additional obligation and not an offsetting tool. 
And now finally, I'm supposed to satisfy any curiosity about the cool down project. It's called the cool down project for two reasons. One is it's about the cooling down of the climate, but it's also about the cooling down of a rather polarized debate um, on carbon removals. Um, it's called a common vision, uh, has a strap line, a common vision of carbon removals um, in the EU. But notably with this project, we are not we're deliberately not prescriptive about the policy instruments for the deployment of carbon removals, but we seek to co-create suggestions for such instruments which with a wide range of, of stakeholders. Um, we have jokingly called our approach the pocket bowl of CDR incentivization because the idea is that we have to find the ideal combination of ingredients um, for CDR incentivization tools. We have to look what's the ideal ingredient from the finance domain, from the goal setting domain, from the enabling a portfolio of CDR methods, uh, from the sustainability criteria and the toolbox of governance mechanisms to put in place. Um, we're in the middle of a workshop series. The second one is this Thursday. We'll have another one in April. And when all this is over, we will hopefully be able to make, to publicize, to come out with some concrete proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine. Um, and I think you are touching on very important points, uh, particularly on the governance and the uses and, and all these aspects. Uh, at the same time, I guess, the. Um, the context that we have painted in the introduction is still very much true with this momentum that we don't want to lose because if we are successful at fixing this governance issue, we want the CDR methods to be able to deliver the megatons we need. So I was wondering if you have already some preferences on what kind of deployment incentives would be best suited for that uh, and the governance around them. Uh, I don't want to commit myself entirely. I think we're still very much into getting the governance right. That is getting the target setting and the revision of the, the EU climate law right. We've also only just had the pa passage of the CRCF and we are not entirely happy with the CRCF. It has some very problem, produced some very problematical um, results. Um, beyond that, our thinking goes in the direction of needing separate instruments for the incentivization of CDR and to caution against the use of any tools we already have, which are designed to help the uh, em emission reductions, to repurpose them, uh, to also serve the incentivization of CDR, because with that we are simply in too dangerous uh, territory. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll, know, I'll now go with a question that any one of you can take, so feel free to, to step up if uh, you're inspired. Um, the first one, I guess, is that these deployment incentives we've been uh, discussing, again, there is a huge variety of them. Uh, in the paper, we have uh, focused on uh, a particular one, but we have already seen others being uh, deployed uh, elsewhere, uh, particularly in the US. And uh, they can serve different purposes. You can use them to accelerate significantly on volumes, for example, because you put money and you buy volumes and you want to meet your targets. You can use them as a false infraction to reduce prices. That's what the US is doing, particularly. Um, you can also use them uh, as a vehicle to enshrine good practices uh, on how to purchase CDR, which kind of CDR uh, should be purchased. So um, and I'm wondering yeah, if you have a take on this, if the EU was to implement uh, some sort of deployment incentives, and maybe, uh, Alexandre Paco, you, you could start uh, if you have a, 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 um, some ideas around this. Uh, what would be the, the main goal, or maybe all of them, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, can I first react to Sabine? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, maybe I was not cautious enough, but uh, I don't think I have said that we will set targets for removals. What I said is that we, we need to look at a number of options, and that's one of them. Um, and that's going to be as part of the climate law revision and the revision of the you know, policy framework that we'll have to do before 2026. So I don't want that you go back home by saying, ah, oh, there is this guy from the commission who is now committed to do what we are dreaming of. Uh, so let me just be, be clear on that. And um, my second point is I'm fully with you on this question of that uh, carbon removals uh, are complement and not a substitute to emission reduction. That's very clear. It's written everywhere uh, 
in the 2040 communication, in industrial carbon management communication. So I, th I think there is no doubt that first needs to come emission reduction. Um, but when I look at also uh, the cost of carbon removals, uh, they're pretty high. So who is going to you know, invest uh, in these expensive technologies without thinking first, what can I do to reduce my emissions? Or the emissions uh, through the, across the value chain. So, okay, I, I understand your point that we need you know, clarity, uh, but I think we should also be realistic on what is the market going to react, and, and I think the price signal is extremely important in this, in this field. Then, a clarification on what carbon removal certification does and does not do. It sets a very, I would say, robust framework for determining the methodologies for what is carbon removals across the various uh, fields, uh, carbon farming, uh, wood-based products, um, and the third one is I need your help, Andrea. Uh, permanent removals uh, with, uh, with BEX and DAX. So that's, uh, that's the purpose, to develop the methodology so that we have at European level a very solid uh, way of, of measuring uh, these this, this units. It is not about the use of the unit. It is not about the use of the unit. So I, I understand what you call for. We need clarity. We need a better governance. Uh, but don't expect it to be through the CRCF. Uh, but there are other tools, and I think the uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive gives already a very important uh, framework for, for how business to business is going to take place around this question of, uh, of, uh, of uh, voluntary carbon market uh, and offsetting. And also now we have current discussion uh, in, in the context of the green claims, that also we avoid greenwashing when uh, business are communicating uh, to, uh, to consumers uh, about uh, net zero products, about uh, climate neutral product, and so on. So this is going to help a lot, I think, uh, in terms of uh, clarity on, uh, on, the use, uh, on the use side. OK, this is what I wanted to say. Uh, but then I forgot your question. Yeah, my, <laughs> my question was, uh, should the EU deploy some deployment incentives? Uh, what would be maybe the priority between you know uh, achieving volumes or boosting volumes that can be purchased and, and generated, uh, yeah. bringing prices down, uh, or uh, also uh, leveraging these mechanisms to enshrine good practices on how you know to support uh, CDR, which kind of CDR? Yeah, my my gut reaction would be uh, by incentivizing, we will do all of that. We will increase volumes and thereby uh, reduce price and uh, have a better exchange of, uh, of uh, good practice uh, in the sector. So I wouldn't be too worried about you know, what do we really focus on. But I would like to give you one concrete example uh, of how we try to incentivize this early you know, stage project. And this is uh, this installation in Stockholm. I mean, everybody knows it, the Bex uh, installation. Everybody dreams about it. Uh, 800,000 tons of CO2 annually uh, should be you know, captured and stored uh, from biogenic uh, source. So very good, very nice. And this has been a project selected under the Innovation Fund. So competing uh, with many other types of technologies in the sector, in the sector meaning uh, industry, clean tech, and so on. Um, so we are going to provide, we have signed with, with this company uh, a grant agreement of uh, 200 million euros, if I recall well, correct, uh, Andrea? No, you have to correct me. Huh? Uh, no, no, I think it's a little bit more than 200. It's more, okay, it's even more than that, okay. But it's, uh, it's not covering the whole um, uh, funding gap. And here, I would like to you know, really go uh, together with, with Paolo that uh, we need a better uh, project financing for this type of project because with the Innovation Fund, we can go up to 60% of the funding gap, but this, this company still needs to you know, find the rest uh, to get this you know, uh, financial close for, for, its, uh, for its project. So they're looking at uh, the carbon, um, uh, voluntary carbon markets, uh, they're looking at uh, the Swedish authorities. Uh, so all of that is pretty complex. Um, so I think 
by accompanying this project, this big project, uh, with some really good advice on, on, on project financing, I think we can make a difference. At the moment, we still wait for the project to really deliver because they haven't finalized their, 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 their financial close. Uh, so, and there are also many questions that we have discussing with them about clarity on the regulatory framework. Uh, so all of that contributes to make this project uh, really uh, starting on the ground. So it's not as simple as we give money and that's it. It's really accompanying the project uh, to, to get uh, off the ground. Thank you. Uh, any other reactions to this question? You want to copy? Yeah. I, I just want to react very briefly. Beware if politicians say briefly. It's a monologue of an hour. Um, but very briefly on that question of should we already look at different use cases of CDR versus uh, emissions reductions? And I, I think um, Mr. Paco said something very um, important. The price, the, the market price at the moment for CDR is much, much higher than simply reducing your emissions. So if you can, it's in your best interest to reduce emissions for purely financial motives. If a company has no other ulterior motives, at least their balance sheet is normally a very a strong indicator of what they care about. And so, so I believe that emissions reductions is something that will happen based on regulations that we have and that will become stronger over the next years. So the question is, should we still wait to develop CDR use cases or should we, to, for them to be perfect, for them to be very Puritan? And I strongly believe that we should have started much earlier talking about CDR and actually investing into CDR than wait until the IPCC told us, oh, this is the red light, you really have to go now. And now we are back in a situation where the European continent, a bit like in other tax sectors, is lagging behind. We see the US doing with the IRA uh, stuff that we still only dream about. We see China, uh, India doing stuff where, where they are actually deploying uh, CDR technologies on the ground, where we in Europe are still debating whether it's the pure way of uh, fighting climate change. I think there is a moment to talk about the theoretical and the philosophical aspects of how do we fight climate change. I think we should get our priorities straight, which is we want to reduce first, but I think the markets are already doing that because it's simply cheaper. But we also need to boost our investment into the technologies that we will need if we want to be a leader in the next 20 or 30 years. This is not tech, this is hard tech. CDR is not something that somebody will build in their garage over a weekend and then deploy on a large scale. They might be building a CDR project for their home use in their garage over the course of a few months, but in the end, it's hard tech. So we need researchers working together with the companies to deploy that on a larger scale. And we see all the issues that the big players in the market have. Uh, I was lucky enough to visit uh, Climeworks, and if, if you look at the pictures and, and you see them, you think this is a huge farm already uh, present. If you're there, you, you say, oh, this looks like a big HVAC system. I guess there are bigger HVAC systems than what Cl Climeworks is currently doing. So you have that difference between where we need to be and where we are currently. So we really need to bridge that gap and so I find the name Carbon Gap quite fitting. <laughs> and and Simon, if I, do you want if to I could just oh, add yeah. something is, and I think we need to understand also what the dynamic of the CDO market is. It's a futures market. Companies are not buying credits and getting them delivered now to retire them now. They're very much setting up their procurement strategy, building up their CDR streams for them to hit their targets, set by standards that clearly define that they need to reduce their carbon footprint by 90% and remove the rest with permanent removals. And here I'm referring to SBTI. And so the dynamic is very much different. And it's very much what you're saying. Right now, people are funding this to constitute their streams to consistently hit their targets. Um, 
And there, well, there's much to be said, I think, because we've, we've had already a lot of this uh, different conversation. I think some of the elements that are a bit concerning to me hearing about, uh, for instance, what the European Commission does is uh, already kind of picking winners as well, like uh, doubling down or narrowing the definition of what is an acceptable carbon removal credit with DAX and BEX, when we know that they are growing you know, open-end systems that could deliver very large quantities of carbon removal credits at very uh, efficient prices, mm -hmm. fostering broader market adoptions of these technologies. Um, and, uh, and also, I'd be very cautious about setting in place um, in deployment incentives that are not market-driven, that are artificial, that are not sustained by real private demand. Uh, I think there are clearly deployment incentives that we can, that can leverage what the private sector is already doing, and I was referring to these funds that provide these bankability guarantees to enable project financing. So it's really important that we keep our focus on what matters, and for us, it's very much you know, enabling project financing. CarbonX's job is to rationalize the procurement of CDRs so that we get these bankable offtakes, and if we can have the guarantees that these are bankable to get you know, infrastructure funds, then you know, fund these projects, then I think we're on the right track. Um, and we don't, I don't think, uh, you know, the, um, if we do adopt such a course, I don't think we'll be at odds with the United States or any other country. I think we have, we have very much our chances because also today some of the biggest buyers are European. It's very, it can be very much our own market. We can define, and I think, what the rules are. And if we do things right, not only can we be independent when it comes to sourcing these credits, but also we can be an exporter of these credits. So that's what I had to um, say. Yeah, so I mean, you, you will have the floor. I just want to mention three concepts that I think are floating around you guys as you're talking. Uh, so the first one is uh, the like-for-like -like principle that Carbon Gap has supported quite extensively. And I think that's the underlying assumption of emission reductions happening uh, and the, the high cost of CDR, you know, uh, avoiding some of the problematic situation. Uh, this works as long as the like-for-like -like principle is enforced and, and uh, limits the uses of you know, potentially cheap and non-permanent credits for, for compensating some emissions. I think another one is um, how you draw a line between uh, residual emissions and other emissions because that's something we are all struggling with to pr precisely draw this border and then have a clear definition on you know, where, where it is okay to use CDR and where not. Um, and I just wanted also to mention this um, big debate that has happened over the last months on CSCF and the definition so that it's inclusive. Uh, I think it, it, it has improved uh, in the final step, uh, but it's very important indeed because some of these methods uh, that could deliver important volumes of CDR, permanent CDR, do not need a geologic storage, which is currently a constraint in Europe. So that's where it was so important. Sorry, Sabine, do you want to react? Okay. I hope somebody of you is going to ask Silva about the like-for-like like principle and how it helps us. Um, my impression is still it's an offsetting debate. It's, it's a concept that helps us when we discuss residual emissions, but not any emissions that um, we discussed before we go into this strictly residual emission territory. But this is not what I wanted to, <laughs> really what I wanted to pick up on. Um, Sven, you are completely right in saying at the moment, um, removals are so much more expensive than uh, emission reductions or the, or the carbon price for, for emissions. Um, we don't need to worry about um, removals replacing uh, emissions. But the strange thing is they're nevertheless debated in that vein. Uh, there's nevertheless a debate about um, CDR integration into the ETS. And when you look at the debate around the um, CRCF, the Carbon Removal Certification Framework, Monsieur Paco, I, I, I fully understand that it's, it hasn't set out to define uses, that that is left for later. But the question was nevertheless in the negotiation space. And what is clear is that the voluntary carbon market, in other words, corporate buyers of CDR units are being eyed up. It's not for nothing, for example, that there isn't a, an exclusion of um, uh, no ex um, that there isn't a provision of corresponding adjustments already being talked about in the CRCF. In other words, an exclusion of double counting and double claiming of uh, CDR units, both by governments, by states, and private private purchasers. So it, that already gives us a foretaste of where the use case is supposed, to, is supposed to come from. Side note also, problem with the CRCF is it certifies units um, 
that are that represent non-permanent storage and have actually no benefit uh, for the climate. We see that as a as a problematical area. Anyway, um, yeah, I think I can leave it. I think I can leave it there. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Sabine. And maybe one last question before we we go to the room. Um, I think we already touched somehow on that, but there is a risk of specialization with you know, some CDR methods developing faster than others, and then suddenly they get more attention and more support, and, and then there is a, a risk of specialization. So I would like to ask the panel uh, how deployment incentives could be used precisely to address this and make sure that all viable and safe CDR methods can find the support and scale, uh, even if, for example, as we mentioned, BEX and DAX, for example, are mentioned uh, uh, all over the place, but there are also, uh, other methods that also need the support. So, yeah. Uh, I know, Sven? Honestly, I don't think that that risk is that big because just look at private transportation. Um, we were very technology neutral when it came to how the future cars will be driven as long as they are carbon neutral. And very quickly it emerged that the most financially viable solution are battery electric vehicles. Period. The market has decided it's uh, hydrogen uh, use in personal transportation is not viable. So the market has moved to the BEV uh, segment. In professional transportation, it's different. So the market has adopted a different technology in the in the professional transportation sector, and we see the same happening probably in the future in aviation, where currently we talk a lot about SAF, but in the future we'll probably see. Uh, hybrid forms of uh, aviation. And I think that the risk of us politically forcing one vision is very little if there is a market-driven economy behind it. And we've seen it not quickly enough for the Puritans, but we've seen that uh, yeah, coherence emerge in the private transportation sector at least. Okay. Mr. Paco? As you said, Sylvain, the CRCF is, is broad enough in terms of the methods you know, that could be used uh, for, for removing carbons uh, from the atmosphere. Uh, so, yeah, if there, are, there is a, a need to even broaden that, I think the expert group might be a good place for, for, for discussing it, but I, I understand that this is not yet the case. Paul, do you want to add? I think, I mean, and here I talk from the private sector's perspective, we're continuously evaluating new CDR removal pathways, new projects, and we're, and also it's very topical. I mean, depending on which industry you're in, you know, t certain uh, corporates will prioritize certain or specific removal pathways. So what I would try to avoid is, again, kind of enforcing a certain vision, and that's why I really like the, um, uh, the bankable fund, because it's on the back of uh, actual market-driven offtakes, which typically will look at a broad range of, uh, of technologies and identify per, uh, per topic, per th theme, uh, what are the category leaders, what are the most appropriate uh, removal pathways and underlying projects. Um, and with experts, what I'm a bit scared about, uh, you know, these expert groups is that at the end of the day, there is still a limited group of people. Uh, and there can be a lot of interference um, and so we've seen that, and so again, I would try to be a, take a more uh, be cautious about these these type of approaches. Really, look at what the market is doing. Look at what CarbonX is doing. Um, no, but independently from that, and uh, and 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 back it off. Can I correct you on the expert group? Because I don't think there is a place that is m not more transparent than the expert group that we have set up. How many? Uh, expert we have 72 experts you know selected uh, across the whole value chain um, it's completely uh, open in terms of uh, its web stream so the next one is in the 11th of, of fully so and but you can if you, you're not yet on the, on, 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 on <laughs> you just got a okay. limitation. I'll, I'll invite you on the 15th of April then, uh, and please provide your input. I mean, listening to the debates, provide your input, your knowledge on the sector. I mean, it seems so wide, and I'm, I'm really pleased that I'm, I'm sitting beside you because I'm, I'm learning a lot. 
Um, and uh, yes, please, please, please come in. We need you. We need all you know the brains uh, because this is such a challenge. All right. On this very good note, uh, I would like now to open the floor to the room for if you have questions to this panel. Uh, so. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Meinert van der Speck, Research Center for Carbon Solutions at Herdward University. Um, <laughs> Aaron and I were just uh, debating that we're not on the expert panel, but then we realized that we're not in the EU anymore in the UK, so <laughs> that, that must be the reason. <laughs> but that's not what my, my question or, or comment was about. I mean, what, what you see in the discourse at the moment very much is it's going towards deployment, financing, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, and, and I agree, that's very important, and sorry, policy as well. So stable policy, stable um, outlook for, um, for, for getting your projects funded and, and, and financed over, over a long period. But at the same time, I would argue that there are two, two other major gaps uh, that I'm not hearing you talk about and that were actually in the, in the strategy, so I was very happy to see that. But w one is capacity building. So everybody in the CDR space is, is struggling to find skilled, uh, skilled people to work you know, for their organizations. Seeing many familiar faces in the room kind of confirms that, although I also see some new, some new faces, so that's, that, that's very good. And the second one is, my proposition is that we don't really know how CDR performs in many cases. And so where governments are indeed working on developing their, 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 their policies and their strategies, but there's very little, and I say this, this as a scientist, but there's very little evidence on, on how different CDR pathways will perform technically, but also economically and, 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 and environmentally. And I don't hear anybody speak about that anymore. There, there seems to be a lot of hot money, as, as, as one of my Canadian colleagues call it, um, that, that is looking for a place to go. It's looking to be invested, either hot government money or, or hot VC money. Um, but we don't really hear many people talk about what does this mean? You know, what, what does a gigaton of, of CDR mean for people and planet, um, energy use, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm hoping to get your feedback on that and bring that into the conversation as well. Thank you very much. I suggest we take another question and then we go but to then the we'll panel. Forget. <laughs> <Sorry? laughs> then we'll forget. Sorry? Then we'll forget. No, no, you have taken notes, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I have. Is this on? Okay. Um, so, Paolo, you mentioned the supply kind of coming in response to a path towards demand. And, you know, one way of doing this is and I imagine kind of the current way that this is being viewed is by setting rules by which supply will be able to access the demand, which comes back to the CRCF. And, you know, if we look into the American context for a moment, the DOE is really having to proactively expand the set of project eligible project types that they'd be willing to fund, you know, beyond just geologic sequestration. And they're having to do a very proactive effort into that at the moment. And so I guess one question for the panel would be, Kind of, would there be advantages to the CRCF taking a more principles-based kind of methodology approach, um, and then endorsing private market standards or protocols that meet those, in order to one be able to move faster to develop these and develop the rules of the road, and then two enable a greater d extent of tech neutrality? Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's remember the first question, and who wants to go first? Maybe Paolo, you, you had a, a reaction you want to start. So the question was yeah, no, around... No, capacity building and uh, measuring impact. Um, on the capacity building, I, I have no specific answer to that. I do agree, although, I mean, we, I, I find it that uh, there is a growing stream of people coming in, very talented people, I think it's a, um, that are pouring in. And so, but then maybe we, we should have a CDR supplier amongst the panel to, to, sh to share that. Um, um, but for me, what, uh, what I wanted to spend a bit of time on is, is uh, on the second bit. So, so kind of measuring the impact um, of, of what, what it actually means to deploy a gigaton. And, and I think what you're referring to, I mean, the way I interpret this is uh, the need for uh, uh, the, the market to really develop with a clear, you know, clear stakeholders and their own responsibilities. Um, and there are, there are now private sector stakeholders looking, the, uh, looking at these impacts. Uh, you have, well, you have private, uh, private uh, you know, where you have think tanks, but you also have rating agencies. Um, you know, part of the work we do is also part of our methodology is, is assessing these risks and, and providing them to the corporate buyers we're working with. Um, what I find concerning, however, uh, is 
that though we're, we're seeing growing number of stakeholders and what we're seeing is the emergence of a functioning market, uh, what I'm really concerned about is, however, I'm seeing a lot of stakeholders playing multiple roles um, under the same roof with clear conflict of interests. Um, and I, I think these are things that we also, we haven't really touched upon, but you know, if from a private, it's not only public, it's from a private sector perspective. That's really what also keeps me up at night because uh, we've seen what happens when we give too much power to a specific entity and how that can impact our market as a whole. And so I think for the CDR market to, to really you know, be sustainable, we need to be very mindful and we need to hold the stakeholders accountable for the role they have and they need to be very clear of what their role is and communicate that openly. And maybe governance here can step in in that sense, and I would welcome that. Thank you. Uh, who wants to react? Uh, regarding skilled workers, skilled personnel, it's an issue across the block for every tax sector at the moment, so it's not CDR specific, and I, I think the risk the reply to that is we need to invest into our higher education, we need to invest into upskilling, reskilling of people. I, I, I could now give the whole European Commission uh, work program for the next 20 years and I think it would fit very prominently there. Um, when it comes to the question on um, should we enlarge or be more technology neutral um, on, on what we do, I believe that durability needs to play a role. It doesn't need necessarily to be stored on the ground, it doesn't, but the question is how durable is the CDR we are doing? And I think the incentive in creating the, the supply should always be linked to the durability. So I can imagine having the incentives being degressive depending on the durability score. So the less durable you are storing the CO2, the less uh, public money as an incentive you could get, or the less the credit would count towards whatever marketplace we are creating, so that we have an incentive to store it in the very long term. But obviously, that's I know that academia is working on durability scores and rating systems, so I don't want to go too much into detail. You are way more experts than I am. Uh, maybe one last reaction, Mr. Paco, and then it will, it will be time to wrap yeah, up. Just a little bit of publicity again for the CRCF. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think all what you said is very true. I think we need uh, transparency on the durability, uh, on the environmental integrity, and all of that is really at the core of the CRCF. So there are very clear provisions about that. So for instance, each unit which will be certified will have a clear indication on, on the duration, for instance. Um, so I really invite you to join this collective work that we are doing with, with all of you uh, in this expert group. It's not going to be us in our offices uh, defining the methodologies. It is going to be you. True. I mean, it is just you know, so important that we set these methodologies right so that we can be really uh, robust and trustful uh, in, the, in the way we set up this new market. So, Please come and uh, and help us. Uh, and here you have Andrea with with me, uh, working you know in setting all the work around the expert group with with others. So please go talk to her, and uh, and we'll be happy to to continue the journey together. Thank you, uh, Paolo. Two seconds, because I, I think maybe it's not clear enough. But I think the CRCF has, however, done so much good. I think it's really moved the needle uh, and has accelerated a lot of the conversation we've had. And I believe. A reason why we're going to see, especially in this year, I believe, some of the highest or largest volume offtakes take place is very much thanks to the, uh, the CRCF. So, so maybe something, I mean, we, we, we like to mention what, what's missing, but I think this has been a very major and significant step towards scaling uh, CDR, especially in Europe. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll end on this very good note. I would like to thank uh, the panel uh, for participating. Maybe we can give them a round of applause. And thank you very much.